Leo, uh, my first question to you is, how did you get involved with, with the, the company NABU? How did you get involved in that? Well, I was, that's actually a really interesting story and I like, and I love telling it. The, um, so what happened was, is that I worked at, uh, uh, when I was in high school, I, I originally worked at Computerland. And the other day I actually noticed that uh, I found this hat <laughs> when I was 16 years old, I worked at Computerland. And uh, so I got very well versed with uh, Apple. Um, um, they, they didn't have any Commodore Pets there. They were selling mostly Apple, but they were also selling like the, 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 the Xerox Star, which was a CPM machine, and uh, and also uh, Ithaca InterSystems. They had a really nice CPM machine with eight-inch floppies and that kind of stuff. So I got well versed with CPM. When later on, when I was in high school, at, when I was 18 years old, uh, we had a computer camp, um, and it was done. The Auto Board of Education uh, did a computer camp. It was the very first th the one that they did, and uh, they asked one of the uh, computer science teachers that was actually the most experienced um, at my high school. I was at Glebe High School. In Ottawa, and they we basically designed a computer camp. We had we built a whole pile of lessons in BASIC, and over the summer in 1982, we ran this computer camp over six weeks. We had a great time, um, and and we had we, we learned a heck of a lot. Even the instructors and that kind of stuff. We were we were using Commodore Pets because that's what the Auto Board of Education used, uh, and they were networked together with that system called Muppet. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but basically it was a, a networking through the IEEE port, and allowed everybody to share floppies and the printer. Um, and so we we had labs set up with that. We also had like logic boards as well. So we were teaching people like NAND gates and AND gates and OR gates and that kind of stuff. It was very, very comprehensive. Uh, but we had these 10 basic lessons. And um, at the end of the summer, we got win that uh, of this thing called NABU. Now I had actually applied at NABU like when I was 16 years old, when I was working for Computerland to do anything. Um, at the time they were manufacturing at the 1100s and that kind of stuff. Um, and they were just forming at the time. Um, but I didn't actually get a job then. Um, but at the end of the summer, some people from NABU, they ended up uh, showing up. And um, what they did is, is they said, we want to buy your basic lessons. They were looking for content to put on the NABU network. At that point, I had no idea what the NABU network was. It was explained to me that it was a software distribution mechanism that went over the cable. I didn't actually appreciate how, how, how genius that was at the moment that they were asking me. So uh, I, I, I just thought it was great because they said, the, the, they wanted our software and they wanted us to write more software for them. And I said, oh, that's even better. So I was basically ending up living my dream. When, uh, when that actually occurred uh, uh, at the end of the summer, uh, they were invited to go in. I went into the, I went into NABU and I, and I went and I spoke to a gentleman named Michael Bates, who was also famous around here for doing the world's worst movie festival. And he was doing, he was interested in, in the video games. He hired me on the spot. He said, uh, and, and, and three other people, uh, from our computer camp also joined Chang Chow, um, um, Laura Shenning, and and Greg Adams. So I was 18 years old. Chang Chow and Laura were 17 years old, and Greg Adams was 16 years old when he started at NABU. So that and that, sub, that started at the end of the summer in 1982. I was just leaving high school. I had just graduated, so I was going to uh, to college in the fall, uh, Algonquin College in Ottawa. Uh, and so I started there, and it, that, and that was great. So we started at NABU, and that's what we did. We we ended up working at the at the, the back of the uh, uh, an old cable office in Ottawa, and uh, we started writing games. I we got paired with um, 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 other other experienced programmers because we were essentially part time. We were hired part time, knowing full well that we were going to school. And uh, there were other a couple of people there at the time as well. Todd McNaught and Tim Ranger were also there. And they were in uh, college already at the time. So they were a little bit older, 19, I guess, at the time. So, and, and Todd McNaught wrote Demotrons. He was writing it at the time. I started working with Ken Shimizu, who, who's also known in the Coleco world for doing many games, uh, writing Roulette. Um, and at the same time, I was working on the idea of Pac-Man just as a chaser game, as a generic game, as a chaser. I didn't have, actually ever dream that we'd ever get the rights to Pac-Man. I didn't think we could. I thought it was just <laughs> way too expensive. But I, and, but the idea of a chasing game, there were lots of those around, like Targ and with Jawbreaker and, and stuff like that. I thought that it was a, a Maze Chaser was a worthwhile genre to build. And fortunately, I started on it early enough that and somebody, one of the salesmen saw it and actually went after Namco and um, went after went after the uh, uh, the rights for it. So and when he did that, 
he used my he used my uh, software as a demo to show them how good it was, and it was actually the best one at the time. It looked the best because we I had eyes and the ghosts and that kind of stuff, and and the Atari one was really the Atari twenty six hundred one was out, and it was really not that great. Um, so people were hungry for a good version that was closer, and uh, it worked out very very well. We ended up uh, going to the arcade game uh, the arcade and taping it. I, I knew somebody worked at an arcade, so he had no problem. Uh, giving us a roll, uh, 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 we would buy a, a, a roll of tokens and we'd start feeding it, and we just recorded it over an hour. I used that and um, a number of other uh, techniques. Like we, I found a book called Mastering Pac Man by Ken Houston, and it got pretty close. And we used that to get the rights to it. I, Nabu paid a million and a half for those rights for the first three years. Uh, Pac-Man, Dig Dug, and Galaxian, which were the first, first three that we, we did. So that's essentially how I got started. I don't want to completely take over the session, but that's, no, that's fine. how we got started. We were part-time games programmers when we were very, very young, like right out of high school. Wow. Yeah. And uh, as, as far as your work schedule, did they kind of give you, uh, uh, did they have like you had to work so many hours a day? Did you have to come in a certain time of the day? Could you come in like in evenings or... How, how'd that go down? So, so we worked whenever we could, which was kind of neat. Oh, okay. um, um, but they didn't put any pressure on us to do anything. At the time, NABU itself, the NABU computer had not even been built. We were using uh, another product of NABU called the NABU 1100, which was a big, huge uh, wooden box uh, that was an S100 system. And that's and it had eight inch floppies. And that's what we used to develop pretty much for the first couple of years because the NABU PC hadn't been formalized yet. And in fact, we had um, uh, like a bridge card, an S100 card that was most of the NABU uh, uh, video and sound. And But it had a major difference in the sense that the, the NABU 1100 work, ran at the Z80 at, at 4 megahertz, which is what it, its native the Z80As, I think, was 4 megahertz. And, uh, and I guess Z80 if we're talking about US ones, right? And uh, But... Um, the NABU is only uh, 3.68 because they, they they split off the clock of the of the video processor. And this actually has a ton of advantages, but it also is a little bit slower and it's a little bit different. So we had to take we had we had to compensate for that when we were writing our software. I never wrote my software to use software timing. I always like using interrupts for timing because I knew that they were accurate. And NABU had one available that happened on the video interrupt every 60th of a second. So we knew we could feed the video right at that second while the while the vertical blanking interval was going up. And we wouldn't get snow or swimming or all kinds of weird effects and artifacts oh. and that kind of stuff. So we learned a lot during that time. Uh, and we could work whenever we wanted. And in fact, I was just starting college, which had a Swiss cheese schedule, kind of. So I could work a lot. And uh, and I also had a car and motorcycle. So it kind of worked out. So I, I could go there whenever I wanted. Uh, I did that more than most of the other ones. The other ones were still in high school at the time. So they really had a kind of a... A, 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 a tight schedule so they could take a long time greg adams for instance was 16 he worked on the ping game which was like pong um and and it, he did that over the course of like four months but i mean that was all part-time right and he, at the time we were also gearing up and learning how to use the system and as i said the nabu wasn't quite there yet we were actually experimenting with what we could do with the hardware at the same time we were trying to write a game um and we were there was never any pressure to do that stuff but magically the stuff started appearing like and we were using our each other as QA at the time too. Like developers would say, you know, like, well, let me try your game, and we play for a while. And say, ah, I found it, made a crash, ah, right. And that's the way that we did our QA initially. So later on, they did the same thing with high school students. They uh, brought a QA that was all high school students, just like we uh, video game developers. And we had li literally fights and stuff like that, like high school level pranks and stuff on each other and, and that kind of stuff because we were almost at war at the time it was kind of neat but there was an, it was never any pressure for us to work we just worked when we wanted to but in fact what that ended up with was timesheets that were like 35 hours a week part-time right it was like because it would be you know 12 hours on saturday 12 hours on sunday and a smattering of stuff during the week right that's and that's how it, it ended up that way so it was kind of neat right. sounds like a pretty neat work environment for sure back in the day I think everybody was actually making it up as we went along because we were building something that nobody had done. And so we were all kind of weirded out about like I worked with the engineers a lot, even the hardware engineers. And 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 I complained about the joysticks we were using or the response time of this or that and that kind of stuff. And so mm -hmm. we worked really, really closely together with the people that were working on the hardware at the same time, which was kind of neat. We were in the same area. Wow. So Neva was a big company and had several products. So 
the NABU PC development was a little bit divorced from the rest of the, there was the NABU 1100, as I said, but there was an, also an, a 16-bit computer called the NABU 1600. I think DJ has one. Um, and the MSUs, the, what we call the mass storage units that we were using were co-opted to be used as hard drives for the NABU PCs for the developers in the long run when we changed development systems. So it was kind of neat to have to have that thing around. Wow, that's that that is, and so there's a there's a couple versions of that machine then. Well, no, there's a Nabu Nabu PC, which is the home unit that we made, and there was a different machine called the Nabu 1100 that was a business machine. As I said, it, it, oh, okay. it, it was made out of wood. It it smelled like IKEA is the the thing that I always have to say. <laughs> Santo has one. Santo Noctifera has one. So it's and he might even have one of the ones that I used because there weren't that many. There was like maybe two dozen in total, I think, in uh, of the development machines. So there wasn't that many for them to be around. So the fact that he has one of the the Nabu PC development machines that's pretty amazing. That because uh, because I mean, there's not that many around, right? <laughs> and uh, so now I'd like to ask uh, DJ. He's been be, been very quiet there, uh, but anyway. So DJ, how how did you how, how did you get into the computer uh, industry, writing code and all that stuff? Okay, that's a better question to asking how I got into Nabu because that was my dad. <laughs> I was born. That's how I got into Nabu. <laughs> um, how did I get into computer industry? Well, my my family had a, a huge history in, in computing. Um, so my uncle John and uh, as everyone's heard the story of my uncle John Bobak, my uncle Howard Schurz, and my dad. Um, my uncle John was roommates with uh, John Kelly. And I got this whole story from my uncle John. Um, we had lunch with him with uh, with Leo a couple weeks ago here, and talked a lot about it. But the, there, they, my whole family was very into computers, like very into electronics, um, Czechoslovakian. So there was very logical thinking, right, and logical approach to things. So um, when when Nabu started, I was just born, and it turned into a whole thing for our family like everyone in the family was really involved into it not just in, on on backing it like our investment wise but also trying to get involved any way they could so i was surrounded by computers at a super young age and my dad was like if i can program you can program like when i was like six years old so i was right yeah so um man i could tell you stories i have i have some pretty crazy stories that almost sound unbelievable but my first computer I think I was, I think I was seven or eight, and my mom would have to tell you the whole story. But for Christmas, I got about eighty gifts, and they're all tiny little boxes. And when I opened it up, they were just computer chips inside and sockets. And inside of the final one was a PCB, a blank PCB, and it was an Apple II clone. And I still have it. And for the Christmas break, and I again, I was seven or eight, right? And I already knew how to solder because I was my dad at this point. Um, so Nabu had failed, and then Apple Canada started. My family was part of Apple Canada. I think um, Leo, do you remember what John said? Was it we had forty nine percent of Apple Canada or something like that? It was some huge amount. Yes, it was. Yeah, uh... yeah. So my family owned, like, I think it was like around forty nine percent of Apple Canada, and uh, so I I had seen. Wozniak and, and Jobs when I was when I was quite young at the office there and it was it was kind of neat um, I, at the time I didn't know right it's neat now at, at the time I was just a little kid but um, so Apple was a big deal for our family so I got this computer and I had to put it together over the Christmas break so when I went back to school and the, you know the teacher would be like what'd you do on the Christmas break and everyone would get up and talk about it you remember that back in the day whenever we would do a, a little talk <laughs> I got up and I was like I made a computer well this particular time was funny because the teacher actually thought I was fibbing and called my mom and said, your son is fibbing. He's like coming to school and saying all these crazy things. Like you should, you know, he's obviously interested in computers. And my mom was like, no, that's what he did. And she's like, but what? He's eight or whatever it was in grade one or grade two. Right. So that is kind of like a little brief story about <laughs> how weird my family was giving me computer stuff <laughs> at a super young age. Um, and then my dad took over a video game company called Selectomatic Games. And Selectomatic was a video game company that was involved with the creation of Neo Geo and a few other things. So that um, that was all Northern Ontario and then got into Manitoba. That's, those are Canadian states, by the way, for people watching the states. But um, so then I got really involved in, into just electronics through that. And then I was born just over there because I'm at my cabin right now in the in the city of Thunder Bay. And there wasn't a lot of work for computers. Um, 
other side of the video game thing that my dad was doing. Our family from Ottawa was there, but I just had an attraction to robotics and machine learning and stuff. And I gotta remember, this is like the 90s, so it wasn't that advanced, but I ended up dropping out of high school, moved to Calgary, worked for a robot company, and then uh, started my career there. And then from there, I worked for multiple companies, including I did some work at NASA, I did some work at uh, Cisco Systems, Semantic, um, all over the place. And then I sold two companies, oh. and then now I'm on my third because apparently I like to torture myself. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's... Uh... That's impressive. Um, now, now I met I might might have met DJ way back in the past. That's right. When we now because he 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 said he showed up at the Baxter Center. Now one of the things that I used to do is that uh, I was the friendliest with kids at Nabu. So what they would do is, is that when they wanted to have when kids they would have uh, kids do tours, whether it was from schools or that kind of stuff, they would stop by my desk, and I usually have a big bag of pens, usually another big bag of candies, and that kind of stuff. And I would I would talk to them about video games and what I was working on and that kind of stuff. Now he says that he saw he did that and he saw somebody. He doesn't remember it was me specifically, and I don't clearly I don't remember it was him specifically. But there was a possibility that we crossed paths way back even before we met recently. So that's wow. kind of that's right. And and funny funny thing about that as well. Leo and I were chatting about what I remember about the building. Um, there, so you walked into the lobby. And I was telling Leo I said I remember this. You used to walk in the lobby. It was brown. Everything was brown, right? Because of course, I mean. Yeah. It was 1984, <laughs> and um, but what was neat about it that my family would always do to us is there was a, a window and a door that went into a server room, and it was like the server room you picture of the 80s, like with the raised floor and the, you know the machines in the middle and stuff, and it was freezing cold in there. And as a kid, <laughs> the parents we they used to open the door and tell us to go in, and they'd shut the door and lock us in. Now we would do it every time; we'd fall for it because it was a funny thing to do, but it was. Like what? How did you describe it, Leo? It was like overly cold, or oh, it, it, it was stupid cold. This is what stupid I said. <laughs> it, it was it was actually far colder than any server room should be, really. But yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> it was, was in the middle of the cold. building, and the air conditioner was right beside it, so it was like literally like right. The vent was right there. They just sort of cheaped out. Normally, a server room has kind of its own air conditioning. No, no, no. They just put it right beside the building's air conditioning and put a direct vent into that room, and that's the way that worked. <laughs> So that that's, but that that was in that room that you saw. That was the 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 Vax is what we used for doing the that we were writing most of the software for uh, figuring out how to do the cable. That's the the QPSK stuff with the the adapter. But also was one of the at least one of the cells, the Gould cells, was in there too, uh, that we were using for development. So that was that that would inject the cycle into the cable stream. That's how it worked, and. Uh, so, so that's what you saw when you were in that room. So it was the, the, the Vax and the Gould, um, which was an interesting machine, by the way, just because I'd never seen anyone, any mini that worked exactly like that one. And it was reliable as hell, much more than the Vax was. So just an interesting fact. I don't, I don't even seen anybody else talk about them through time either. <laughs> they used to run 24 seven and cable head ends and that kind of stuff. And when, when we put them in there, uh, they were good. So, so, in present day, how did you two meet up? <laughs> Leo, would you like to tell the story? <laughs> well, I'll tell us part of the story anyway. Um, the uh, when when uh, DJ had started uh, making videos with the Nabu, Adrian Black had put his video out. People were buying the Nabu PCs that were on, on eBay because of that video, uh, and DJ had started doing the videos. Now, actually, what happened was is that. I had been scouring the internet over and over and over again, and there's evidence of me doing that because, of course, uh, the 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 uh, York University also, I dealt with them in the past where they did um, uh, uh, Zbigniew uh, Stachniak basically created one of the first recreations of the Nabu adapter, and it's housed at York University. So I worked with him in like 2009, and that was fine. But I kept on scouring the internet. But he he sort of did it and make, made an exhibit at York University, and then everybody else went to sleep, and then everybody else about, about Nabu. Um, but so when Adrian Blox uh, did, did that, that video, there was a lot of interest in it, and people bought the Nabu PC. So now several hundred people have Nabus, and one of them was DJ. Uh, and of course, he had other ones from that, that he could draw on because he had them in his family. So he started working on the Nabu adapter. And in fact, I didn't know about that right away. And in fact, weirdly enough, Tim Ranger is the one that contacted me that said, hey, by the way, there's this, uh, this guy that that's, uh, seems to be making a Nabu adapter, and he's getting pretty far. Can you uh, you want to take a peek? And I said, okay, sure. And I did. And I said, and I saw that. And, and in fact, I started watching the videos and I said, okay, he's getting pretty far. So maybe we can sort of 
I, I, I can see it. I can see if I can see if we can do something. Now I have, of course, a backup of the uh, of the cable software from like 1984. In fact, I had two backups uh, that are recent. We'll, we can talk about that a little bit later. But um, um, in 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 one case, I said, okay, well, I think he's getting pretty far. So what I'll do is I. I, but then I figured out I, I I I don't know how to talk to him. I don't know his email address is, but you're on LinkedIn, and LinkedIn makes it extremely convoluted to try to contact somebody who's not in the first three levels of your of your friend list kind of thing, right? So I eventually figured out that you could follow and then sort of send a message, and then I sent him a message saying, and the message was that I sent him was it says, by the way, uh, um. Um, no, I will make all your Naboo dreams come that's true. That's right. I said, I said, <laughs> I said yeah, exactly. I said, I can make all your Naboo dreams come true. And that's the, I, no, I said, connect with me and I can make all your Naboo dreams come true. That's right. And that's yeah. all I said. So you can go yeah. ahead, DJ, if you want to continue yeah. on from there. Yeah. So I'm going to, let's, let's back up a little bit too. Cause uh, so my part of the story about how I, this Naboo thing came about was I've been holding on to Naboo stuff forever. Like I brought a few things out here to show you. This is my dad's share certificate. So pretty, pretty wild to see. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Um, I showed this off at, uh, at BCF East and it's been in a couple of my videos since, but my uncle John Bobak gave it to me and I'm super, super happy that he did. It's one of my most cherished items in the world. This is, um, wow. this was given to all of the executives uh, that started the company. So NABU was formed out of how many companies was it, Leo? Five. So it was, was Andacom was one, which was the NABU 1100, where the NABU 1100, they came from. The Bruce Instruments, which is where the, 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 the cable knowledge came from. Yeah. Um, Doma Software. Uh, who else? Who else? Who else? Who else? Computer Innovations. Computer Innovations. And I'm trying that to remember. Was, there was one more. Was cool, yeah. There was, was one. Wild. Oh, oh. Um, Volker, Volker Craig. Volker Craig, the, the terminal manufacturer. Yes. Yeah. So... so Go ahead. So, yeah. Okay. So anyway, so everyone got one of these little plaques. So my 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 grandpa or my uncle gave it to me. But anyway, so I had all the stuff, right? I've been sitting on all the stuff for a super long time, minus the the plaque I showed you. I just got that a couple weeks ago. So anyway, so I have a friend who's a who's a pretty big YouTuber named uh, Robin Eight Bit Show and Tell. And so Robin uh, he lives in Thunder Bay, and I always like attending his vintage uh, retro. I'm not sure if it's retro or vintage. I know there's always discussions around it. Uh, his old computer club. So um, I like going there and just hanging out with the guys. Like it's a lot of fun just to, to, to nerd out. And one day he says, sends me a text, he goes, listen, do you want to bring a bunch of that Naboo stuff? Because he knew about Naboo because he worked for my dad. So my dad, like he, he, he passed away a long time ago, but when he was alive, it was like, that was the big dark cloud over his head was Naboo. Like he always talked about Naboo, how Naboo could have been. And every time he saw the internet, he'd be like, oh, the Naboo could have been the internet. And anyway, so robin's like bring the nabu stuff so i bring it and all these people at this computer club are looking at it and they're all kind of scratching their head and it's almost they're looking at me almost as if i made it up because like nobody's heard of this right you think in 2023 at this time this point or 2022 2022 people would have known about nabu right so they're looking at me like uh and looking at the pile of stuff at the table and looking at me and looking at this computer and they're just like trying to put two and two together and most people just backed off they didn't even really want to engage the conversation because i think they were taking trouble protest pro uh, processing this so i go back to calgary i leave my cabin here and go back to calgary this is in like end of november two weeks later i got a text message from robin and he's like ebay now nabu with a link and sure enough, there's all these Naboo's on on there. Like just super coincidental that I just did this presentation thing and all of a Naboo shows up. So I was like, how did I say it? The VCF East, everyone kind of quoted me. They actually said it for me and I just repeat it, which is kind of like, I got this, hold my beer, right? <laughs> so off I went and started reverse engineering. And I emailed Zig, Zig, Zigmi, Zigni, Zig. Zigniv. Zigmi, yeah. Blah, blah, blah. I emailed Zigmi from, uh, from york university and i email your i email them and i say listen you know i'm connected with the family there's nabu just came online and i have this whole powerpoint i put together and i said i want to create this i know you guys have done some work already can you help me out and he was like i'm a teacher and i'm only going to give you stuff when you deserve it so he would like write me tests essentially he'd write questions that would be like how does this work or how does this ROM thing work? He'd ask me questions and it was actually kind of funny because the questions he was asking me got me thinking about how the ROM was working, how it was downloading. But he kind of also didn't really want me to, I think, I don't know if he was trying to set me up to fail, but um, <laughs> he gave me files that now that I know the Nabu so well, there's no way they could ever have ran ever in the existence of time. And 
that kind of threw me off for a while and a little bit of a loop because I was spinning my wheels for a while in there. And then once I figured out that what he had given me didn't work, I was able to load my first Hello World. And when I loaded Hello World, that's when I got Leo's email. And three minutes later, I responded. We ended up sitting on the phone for about four hours that night. <laughs> and Leo sent me the main, main menu file. And we had to make one change. Do you remember what the change was to my adapter at the time? Uh, well, there's several changes you had. One was speed in the sense that the speed was weird and you needed more stop bits. Yeah, there's uh, something with the main menu that prevented us from loading it. There was a packet. Oh, the message, the message file. The message file oh, we still haven't figured out. The message and the time. Yeah. We didn't, so, we didn't have time yeah, yet. So, so NABU was really interesting at the time because it had two different things that were that were kind of brand new. If you remember in the 80s, no computer could set its time, not even IBM PCs and that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. NABU did set its time. We got it right from the network. So every now, every now you could request the time pack and it would tell you what the time was. And in fact, that went in the menu and, in, and figured into other things that we were doing. Like uh, we had a, uh, a stock ticker thing that, that, and trend analysis. So when it, it knew that new stuff was there, it could give it to you and it could say that this is different from the old stuff because it knew the time. You never had to set the clock, just like a cell phone, which was really, really, really nice feature. But the other thing that we could is each adapter through a PAL is individually addressable. So we could send a message to a specific adapter saying like, pay your bill or something, which was exactly what it was used for usually, right? Um, but sometimes it was, it was other notices like emergency notices or anything like that. It, it was designed to be that. It could be used as an emergency message system if, if we wanted to. And wow. and so th that's where the DJ had problem with because I had trouble explaining. I knew what it was for, but I didn't know exactly what the format was or where we could get a, something that represented that format. And so that, that, yeah. that would be a big problem. So Having it, said that today, it, they're it doing a lot of that, Oh, sorry. Yeah. The only problem that lasted about 10 minutes, I think, or 20 minutes, remember? Yes, we, exactly. Once he told me what it was, I was able to see the, the data that was being requested, and then I was able to put together what it, I, I thought it was requesting and then which is really kind of funny about my internet adapter is when i did the first release i actually re assembled a time packet but i returned an empty string so forever my internet adapter always had the default time of like zero zero o'clock or midnight or whatever it was so all these other internet adapters as they came out people fixed their time. Now, I knew that mine wasn't working, so I just left it as kind of as a joke, but it became a thing where people would be like, don't use DJ's internet adapter, his time doesn't work. <laughs> so I, I kind of left it for a very long time. I fixed it, I don't know, a while ago. I didn't tell anybody, but I thought it was kind of, I thought it was kind of fun. I got a kick out of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So uh, why do you, uh, um... Why do you, th I mean, I know this thing was really uh, the way that they had it set up, uh, being able to upload, download stuff on the cable system. Why do just, you- Just download. Just download, okay. Just download, yeah. Uh, why do you think, why do you, I mean, it was really ahead of its time, just before the internet. And why do you think it failed in your, in your, in your guess? If you want me to take a crack at it, I will. Sure. There was several. There were several reasons for failure. One of which was money. Um, we had one major, major league investor uh, that literally owned most of the shares, and actually had like a on, on, an on-demand loan. So that literally had a, we had a big bank account to work with for a very long time. Um, and that his name was Robert Compo, and he did, he developed most of the the, the real estate around uh, Ottawa, but in the or the the mid '80s, he started at the the company started to have trouble, and eventually went bankrupt and that kind of stuff. Even though it built up most most of Ottawa, but that dem demand loan came in with a sixty day notice at one one day, and from that period of time, there's actually well documented in in the uh, if you remember the the grunt presses that we had, you can see the, the people panicking right at the beginning and then sort of resolve and denial and that kind of stuff as we move through the, the era. But it, in 60 days, the company was done as it was. But there was actually sort of three eras with NABU. That was the first era was the, that was when all the, all the great times, the big Roman empire version. Then we had a leaner version of it, what I, I called NABU on a shoestring. And I was still there. I survived the layoff and I was one of the one of just a, a couple developers there was still stuff that we were working on and still in progress and we were still pumping out games and that kind of stuff um so, and we continued on for another couple of years afterwards after that there was yet another layoff 
And we were down to a short, and was, I call it the, the Nabu by a hair, which was basically <laughs> me and Bob McNally and a few other people pumping out Nabu PCs and keeping the whole system going so we could sell it off. And John, the, the idea was is that so John Kelly could sell it off. So we had uh, worked with RCA all the way up with RCA. Nabu had gone all the way up and got made a big proposal and went all the way up to the board of directors to buy Nabu and to basically have RCA become the new cable adapter provider of the world. Um, it went all the way up to the board. The CEO said, no, I don't think this is going to work. And it all fell apart, like our house of cards. Uh -huh. And we had nowhere else. We had no runway left. So, so, so that was the end of, of Nabu. Those 2,500 Nabus that went on eBay are likely the remnants from the ones from Tribune Cable in Alexandria, Virginia. It matches the number that I knew of specifically. And uh, it makes sense that they're in the States. Where the other 30,000 that were in Canada went, I have no idea, probably landfill. Mm -hmm. But some of them are out there. You know, so and and there's a small number of Japanese ones too. I, I remember we had a bunch of Japanese cases that my dad used to build uh, project boxes out of. And how much did they sell the Japanese rights for, Leo? Do you remember? Hundred K, hundred thousand dollars, hundred thousand Canadian, which at the time was well, it's about it was about par at the time, so roughly hundred K US too. When I when I talked to my uncle John and Leo and I had lunch with him that one day as well, and Leo asked him a few questions about it, and John continually repeats the same thing um, that I've heard my whole life is they shouldn't have created their own computer, right? And the trouble at the time was, is that you remember when the NABU came out, everyone compared it to the MSX. But if you look at chronologically, the MSX, MSX should be compared to the NABU because the NABU came first. And the it wasn't that the MSX copied the NABU. It was just that if you were to look at building a computer back then in that day, you really only had a few options to choose from. Um, graphics cards, the whole concept of a graphics card or graphics processor really wasn't well thought out yet and wasn't really evolved. So the TMS-99 uh, VDP was really it. That was your really only option if you weren't going to do it you know, with CPU cycles. Intel um, Intellivision from Mattel, they use a similar type VDP as well, but those were really about it, right? Like there wasn't very many. And then for sound options, you had the AY chip and then the, the um, Coleco and the and the Intellivision used an S something chip. So you didn't have a lot of options to build a crate. And of course, Z80 versus a 65, you know, two or whatever from Commodore and Apple. So if they would have created their own computer or wouldn't have created their own computer and they would have been able to come later in the game and build it off an MSX or as John said, John was like, we owned 49% of Apple. Why Why didn't we turn this into an Apple expansion card? But then if you think back to it, your limitations of hardware was just too much, mm -hmm. right? But you would have opened it up to more than just game applications with the Apple. It could have been business applications as well. Who knows what that world could have looked like? You know, maybe one day we can reimagine that. Maybe FujiNet will do that, reimagine the, the Apple connected as a Naboo type system. But that was, I think that was, the, the not building their own computer was probably, uh, you know, building their own computer was probably the thing that cost the most amount of money. How much did they raise in total, Leo? Oh, it was, I think it was, it was blown. It was like 35 million, which at the time in 1980 was a lot. Yeah. It ended up being like 150 million in the long run. Yeah, but... I was going to say, I think it was over 100 million. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's crazy. And um, I don't know, Leo doesn't really talk about a lot of his collection sometimes, but he has an original MSX prototype that is a breadboard screwed to a piece of wood that they sent him <laughs> from Japan. Yeah. Okay. Le le legitimately, this thing is like a hundred thousand dollar piece of history sitting in his basement. It's wow. no case, no plastic, right? It's just a, it's a, it's a breadboard with, uh, with screws holding it all together. Power supply with a big transformer and everything. Because at the time, Nabu was trying to get, well, Nabu, you can talk about this part, Leo. Yeah. Getting other computers. Yeah. So. We, if you notice, a lot of the Nabu titles are MSX games, and that's because we 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 got in fairly quickly with Kenishi, my boss John Short, and and Chris Wallace went to Japan and met with him, and so on, and Bill Gates for that matter, because Bill Gates was involved with MSX, MS, the MS part is Microsoft. ASCII Microsoft was doing it. the ASCII part was Kenishi, who's really well is is really famous and kind of a prodigy in in the world, and sort of designed the whole thing and pushed the whole idea of MSX, more or less himself, and. Um, uh, but he came to Nabu several times, and and I met him. He was, as I said, he was kind of a rock star. But he loved working with us, and he and and uh, he gave he gave us that prototype 
version. I had just happened to have it at home when Nabu folded. So it was, uh, uh, and because it had the Pac-Man cartridge that MSX made, which I considered a, a substandard version of Pac-Man at the time, because it was, I think I thought mine was better and so on. So I thought that I was, I was, and, and I know, and, and I know we could have been the one that the, the Nabu Pac-Man could have been the MSX Pac-Man. I'm just not exactly sure how the licensing would have worked for that. But, um, we had it. We, we 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 had it set up so that um, when we had had Nabu going and Nabu was doing its thing, that we we weren't really sure what to do next. We got stuck when 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 it went all folded, right? It was like, what are we going to do with all this stuff and stuff like that? And in fact, I ended up fleeing the scene. I I, I spent a, I spent a lot of time with John Kelly because I was one of as I said, it was Nabu by a shoestring. We were having a great time. But we knew that the end was coming, and I was getting sort of more and more depressed over the summer and that kind of stuff, um, trying trying to deal with the fact that we were we, we we were going nowhere. If I if I could go back in time, and because we had we had a lot of our own titles, I would have basically started licensing our own titles onto the MSX network and make some money revenue for Nabu. Because if you look at the whole catalog, it's the, the we have a whole pile of, of titles that could have easily been on the MSX network and that kind of stuff. 30 or 40 titles easily and a lot of educational stuff, which MSX didn't do at all. <laughs> so that would, and it would have been great. But I wanted to touch on a point that DJ brought up with um, the adapters. By the time that I left NABU, on my desk, I had four adapters. I had a NABU adapter. I had an IBM PC adapter, which actually could use the regular adapter because really it was just an RS-422 card and IBM PC. I had a Commodore 64 adapter. That's the one. <laughs> right? That plugged into a regular cartridge slot on a Commodore 64 and downloaded it directly. As a matter of fact, the cycles that we have that I've recovered have remnants. They have they have vestiges of the Commodore 64 cycle in them. Um, I haven't been able to recreate that stuff. Other people are actually trying to do that, which would be interesting. And um, but 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 we we went down that road of developing adapters for other PCs. And in fact. I've seen this, the size of the NABU adapter is huge. If you see it, it's the size of the NABU PC. The one that I had on my desk was, was, uh, was at the time it was magic new technology, which was FPGA. Um, at the time, nobody did FPGA. And I had this thing and I said, what's FPGA? And I'm looking it up and I can't even find any info on it because there's no internet, first of all. But I was looking in like scientific journals, which NABU had, right? I'm trying to find about what, what is an FPGA. And I had to actually ask somebody that I knew what it was. And I said, oh, it's, a, it's, it's field programmable. I said, this is a perfect thing for a NABU, for a NABU adapter specifically. And, in, and, the, and the thing is, it was the size of like, it was, it was smaller than a, than a Betamax uh, uh, cassette at the time and I thought this is the most interesting thing and I had like a 12 volt adapter like a wall wart and I said this is great this would have done everything and the last one this is the one that really burns my brain is that we had the FM adapter so it was a NABU adapter that ran on FM frequencies literally you could broadcast it over the radio and that's wow. what it did and we're be, be, or sorry better yet it could use the dirtiest dirtiest of signal so in other words we were in this we were using an experimental band that anybody could use kind of like the way wi-fi anybody can use wi-fi uh, frequencies well there's also in the fm band there's there's the equivalent and we were using them because nobody else could use them and there was no license required for it and we could just broadcast like crazy and in fact it went almost as fast as over the cable which is pretty wow. amazing so if we would have done that we would have been able to broadcast software distribution over the over literally the radios people could buy something and they could they, they they could literally get their software over the radio not over the internet not over cable and the reason that adapter was created in the first place was because cable companies are gatekeepers phone companies are gatekeepers they keep everybody they, oh they're happy to have you as customers but if you actually try to be a partner or or, or make money inside of their ecosystem. No, no, no. They get to make all the money you get to provide for their ecosystem. And that's the way it's always been and will continue going so going forward. But for, for, our, for, for us, it, doing the FM adapter meant that we could literally free ourselves of that. We could use any stuff, unlicensable bands to distribute software. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good place to be. Unfortunately, it never came to be because it was the last couple months that I was at Nabu when I had that adapter in my hands. So, and there, there was also the uh, satellite broadcast as well. Yeah, that was done. Interestingly, that was done for for CCTA. What the way they just did it is they just broadcast a signal to 
uh, a regular cable a, re a regular cable broadcast they 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 beamed from a satellite to uh, the the NCTA show in Las Vegas right so they literally had people downloading nabu P uh, pcs in 1982 in Las Vegas over the satellite so it also worked over that at 6.3 megabits per second it was yeah. pretty good and, and i found out when i was with my uncle a couple weeks ago that it was my dad that actually did the satellite hookup cool that's yeah. really neat. Warren Belkin went in there, and he. I remember they brought a head. They they brought a head end, and it didn't work for one of the cable shows. So he literally took it all apart and put it all back together, and just did the same thing. You know, clean all with alcohol and use a hard eraser on the on the contacts and that kind of stuff. Literally the stuff that you do on a PC, but he did it with a mini computer, which was kind of neat. So <laughs> that's that's the hardware version of reboot your computer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Real wow. big hack. That that is amazing. Uh, just broadcasting it over the FM and uh, satellite back in the day. That's that's yep. pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. Well, the the whole plan, like you mentioned, uh, David, when you asked your question, you said upload and download, and then I corrected you and said only download. Is the original plan was to demonstrate the um, customer base, prove out the customer base that it was a thing that needed upload capabilities because back then the cable systems would have amplifiers in neighborhoods, and those amplifiers were only uh, one direction, unidirectional. They weren't bidirectional. So mm. you couldn't transmit data back upwards to the head end. So there was no way. So the plan was, let's get a bunch of customers. Let's get tons of people using the system. And then that'll convince the cable companies to update their infrastructure. And they didn't do that. They eventually did it, but not till what, 98, yeah. 99 in most areas, maybe a little bit earlier. I don't know. I'm kind of everything back. Everything was 10 years ago to me when you get to this certain point in life. Eh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow, it's uh, that that's really neat. Um, and uh, kind of fast forward a little bit. Now, you guys got to go to it was a VCF East. Is that where you went? And, and we how, did. How, and how was that experience for you? That was terrible, eh? We, are, know, we, are fun. <laughs> we had we'd actually physically met before. We talked a lot on the phone, and we've talked a lot uh, with other people and so on. But we hadn't actually physically met. Um, and even because we, we we met sort of through VCF because Jeffrey Brace was doing those things. So we were having round tables, kind of like what we're doing here. And um, those were a lot of fun. But we had but but there's there's nothing like actually meeting people and that kind of stuff. And the, and the yeah. crowd was really, really good. I, I would have liked the, our placement because we were right at the edge so that the Nabu PC that was, was was shown was kind of like right at the edge of the tour bus kind of thing. <laughs> the last, but, but other than that, no, it went really well. The talks went really well. I'd like to see them because we worked really hard on those talks, both DJ, DJ, DJ and I, and we basically rocked for a couple hours there. And we, I'd like to see the videos when, when they come out because uh, they were they were, they were were a lot of fun. And we met a lot of people. We met Ron and, and, and so on. And uh, Henry. Uh, and Henry and, and Mark. Yeah. And yeah. yeah we had, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. I Like Leo said, we had never met. Leo and I talk on the phone all the time, right? Like we just call each other up sometimes and we became friends, right? That's what friends do. But um, all over Nabu, which is really cool, right? You just kind of mm -hmm. find out you have you have things in common outside of just talking Nabu. So when we met, I don't know, I felt like he invited me to his home. I walked in and sat down in his basement and hung out and played with Nabus. And it felt like we were had always hung out, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of cool. But we went to DCF East. Um, there was a lot of, uh, there was some drama that occurred that I was totally unexpected in the Nabu community last year. And it was, um, yeah, there was some, some people doing some not, not great things. And I kind of stepped away for a while. So when I went down there, a lot of people had this, um, view that I was this bad guy or I was this manipulative person because somebody was spreading rumors about me. So it was nice to meet people. And a lot of people came up and they were like, wow, you're, you're a normal guy, you're a normal dude. And they would tell me stories of things that they heard that somebody had said about me, right? Because, you know, it's, it's, there's always drama somewhere in the world. And it was kind of neat to put faces to names. And, um, you know, we met Henry, and like I mentioned, and um, we, the guy who made Pico Gus, Ian, we went for dinner with him one night. We met a lot of other YouTubers. Ron came up to me, and uh, we had a good conversation as well. I think everyone I met there turned out to be pretty cool people. Yeah, and I like that people came up and asked me and said, "Why did you encrypt the files at the beginning, or why did you do this, or why did you do this?" And we had legitimate answers, and they were all kind of like, "Oh, okay, never, I never thought of that." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it was. All I wanted to say it was, it was really nice to meet people in person, and yeah, fix a lot of that. Well, I think uh, 
going to that event too probably really opened the doors even more for people learning about it. I mean, I, I like a lot of people, I didn't even know this thing existed a couple of years ago. And uh, I was one of those people that got, I dealt, I dealt directly with that guy that was selling them. I didn't go through eBay, eBay. I went right through him and uh, took, a, I got it like in a week and uh, got the box over there on the shelf wrapped up. And it's, right it's uh, I think it's a low serial number too. Um, Oh, they're all low yeah. serial numbers. <laughs> There's only 30,000. Uh, they're all low. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, out of the lot that was yeah. sold there, I think the, the guy had two or three or four. I, I don't know how many he had. Do you, I, do you remember my I, my serial number, Leo? Was it 327? Something like that. I, I have, my, yeah, I have pretty members. low serial numbers on the, my, my units. And the funny part is, is that mine are all kind of different. They have different ROMs. They have different things in them. And oh. they're actually completely different designs. So I actually have a weird chronology of nab was going on in mine because every time anybody sees anyone who is they say where where did you where's that connector what's that for and i said i have no idea i'm just yeah. <laughs> i'm not sure if it's a prototype or it's vestige or what's going on with that we got yeah. one from my uncle and we just laughed because we brought it to leo's house and tried to turn it on and again a weird rom yeah, yeah and a brand new another rom we have to we have to get yes that's my part number there four 241. Wow. But that's the one that says it's an adapter, but it's actually a PC, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. So this one's funny because we Leo pointed this out, which is actually kind of humorous. So check this out. It says it's a an adapter. Okay. Yeah. But look at the very bottom down here. I don't know if you can read it. Probably not. It says over here, it says made in Canada. So this is the Canadian version. And of course, leave it to the Canadian version to screw up and put the wrong sticker on the wrong <laughs> <laughs> this is on a computer. This is on a PC, not an adapter. <laughs> Oh, well, you know, yeah. uh, <laughs> but those are the endearing screw ups of a company trying to pump out a ton of machines at once. Right. And in fact, at the time, uh, the, the Nabu PCs were, were manufactured by uh, at the time was a very little known company called Gold Star, which eventually turned out to be LG. So mm -hmm. and what was funny is when I heard it, they, they said they considered it a pre-production run, the 30,000 that they built. Right? So it's like, oh, my God, you know. <laughs> That's why, probably, why there's so many bodges on the on, on on the underside of the motherboard and that kind of stuff. So, but they they pumped out. The, so that was it was Gold Star now now LG that actually created the the offshore versions of the Nabu PC, the ones that probably were be, are being sold, the ones that say made in Korea. And there was another uh, connection too, right, with um, the joysticks. So at one point they had different joysticks, and then the ones that you'd see now that you see in my videos. I don't know if I have one here. I don't think I do. I think they're inside, but they were made by a company called Zircon or Zircon? Zircon. 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 And they actually were re uh, designed off the molds of the Fairchild Channel F. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when Ch Fairchild Channel F, I guess the company that was making their controllers ended up working with Nabu and made their controllers. Oh, right, Leo's going to go grab one. Let's see if I can find one. Yeah. I, I know, I don't, I just don't know where mine are. I know that they're, I have, I don't have in this box here. But I can show you some Nabu stuff while we wait. This is kind of neat. This was my dad's um, exhibitor badge for Cable 83 for Nabu. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh. that, that was cool. And then I always think of using this one day. Let me see if I can find it. I also have the... Uh, let's see if I can find it here. Oh, here it is. This is cool. It's a luggage. You used to put these in your luggage back in the day. Oh, wow, look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And it says in the back cable cable services company. Oh. I have found some controllers. There's that there's the one that he's talking about. This is the ones that we originally popped out with the Nabu. They're they 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 aren't in the boxes that they're selling from eBay, right? They're not selling no. the thing. Okay. So okay, no, I so I to, to date now, I don't know if Santos has one. He Santo would probably be the only other person who has one. You have one, I have one. I have uh, six of them. Yeah, you have six. I used to have piles, <laughs> but um, if you do see other videos, there's a couple of people who have one, but they hold them in weird angles. And if you ever notice that, it's because they're trying to hide the fact that they are the Zircon controllers made for the Commodore 64. And they were they were called the power controller or something like that. I know Henry just purchased one recently. So what had happened is after Nabu left, the company Zircon continued to sell those controllers, but they made a few changes to them. They, there is no button on the front. So Leo, hold up yours again. You'll see there's a button on the front. 
and that button on the Commodore 64 version isn't there. Instead, what you do is you can push down and for the button on the actual yeah. controller. And itself. you can see the mold was used because the hole in the bottom is still there on the Fairchild that came out the bottom. That's whereas right. this thing comes out sort of the side of the bottom. Hmm. So I'm not sure if they were custom made for Nabu just using the mold, but these seem to be unique amongst Nabu. So, but the other one that we sold after we didn't have any of those was this one here, the super stick guy. And uh, this was, this was interesting just because I hated it the most. When you have the fire button on top, you end up moving the joystick while you're trying to fire. So, so it's not that great, but this we gave out later on to, uh, to people um, when, when we ran out of the other ones. But I kind of like the Zircons. They were good, and they lasted over time too. They're they're easy to play to do with one thumb kind of stuff. So I, mm -hmm. I kind of like them. They're better than the you know the Atari joysticks because they sort of dig in your hand being square and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah. I, I have uh, it, it. It's similar to the that red one that you have, but it's a newer version. And there's a switch on it. You can flip it for uh, one side works for Nabu, and I think the other side works for I want to say Atari. Yeah. Um, but but well, anyway, they should yeah. be identical. But they're, they're apparently there is a difference. I'm not sure what it is. DJ might know. Um, but I haven't like, looked into it yet. But you're right because Henry bought a Zircon, like one of the newer controllers, and he can't get it working with the Nabu. So there's some electrical difference that we don't know about. But that's right. I actually, when I was at VCF, I saw they had the arcade versions. You know, with the big ball on top and that kind of stuff. And I was thinking of getting one of those, but they were rather they were rather pricey there. So maybe I figure I can get it online cheaper. So, yeah. so these no, are kind of neat too. These are um, um, forms that they would have filled out for order sheets for doing work internally at Nabu. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. And what's kind of neat about it is I noticed the number down there, 1372. So as they would have to go to customers, um, you have all the customer information in here about what what needed to get done so if they were doing an installation or or a warranty work or something so that just shows you that you know how little the computers actually got used the the numbers for the entire <laughs> their entire wow, printout yeah. only got up to 1300. <laughs> wow that's uh that's that's neat um and uh i know uh leo that you uh in your wisdom you have a lot of the stuff that you worked on as far as software and stuff like that. Uh, big collection of old Nabu stuff that you developed and stuff. Uh, yeah, I have a lot of my software. I put some of it on GitHub. So I got, I, I recovered a, a pile of source. I actually have a little bit more source to recover. Some of it's just a bit more difficult. Plus it's just uh, stuck like working floppy. So it's not complete. Which Where's is Nabu baseball? Yeah, manager's baseball. <laughs> <Where's> baseball? <laughs> Manners Baseball. Is, I just want to make a quick quick comment about that. Manners Baseball is the most complicated game that we ever did on Nabu. Um, what it was was uh, uh, literally a rotisserie baseball being done in on an 8-bit computer. And what that meant was is that it was the biggest game that we had that used the most amount of segments on the Nabu. And Nabu, they, they, they have these things called segments, which were more or less up to 64K of, of, of data. That, that we could draw upon. So what we did is we put all the data for all the major league teams and all their players, American League, for 1984 in Managers Baseball, and you could pick from them and make your own team, and then you can have them play against each other. And it would play against each other and did a really nice job. It was a lot of fun. And it was one of the most interesting games I ever worked on because it made really good use of the Nabu's ability to download stuff whenever, wherever it could. So you also, in order to play this game, you had to be a serious baseball enthusiast because you also had to get a floppy drive to store your your team and in most cases you wanted to get a printer to print off the rosters and that kind of stuff so it, was, it made it, it it really made use of the system um i've recovered pieces of it but not everything about it and that's 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 the most annoying thing because as having one of the best games we ever did and one that i worked on personally uh, with with a team of people which was kind of interesting most of the different games at nabu we worked on one or two people maybe not you, not a ton of people, um, but this game spanned like five people, which was a really was we considered a big team, and as a result, there was like many code segments and that kind of stuff. So, for instance, when you, when you you started the game, picking your roster was one sort of code segment that it would load, and you could save that. And what we used to do is because we were transferring 
between code segments on the cycle, we had to store the data somewhere so that it wouldn't uh, disappear. So we would store it in the video processor. We'd pump it up to VRAM so that when it got when when all the regular RAM got clobbered when a new segment loaded, then we could just yank it out of VRAM and 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 use that. So that's how we we sort of linked the game to each other. It so it would play plays and it had all kinds of amusing plays. It had p th stupid things like when uh, things like a pitcher beating the batter and then the batter sort of rushing the pitcher in a fight breaking out and stuff like that. So it was like little characters on the screen and that kind of stuff. It was a lot of fun and it was ton of work. It was a lot of fun working on it and it had so much detail. But I'm having trouble recovering it. But people would like to see it. So it's like I, I tell people a lot about it, but it's like. I, I really like to get more segments. I have pieces of it, as I said, pieces of the code segments that I can show, but not everything. So I can't really put it all together. And it's frustrating because I just don't remember. That's the other part too. <laughs> <laughs> we found a lot of good stuff. Uh, Leo yeah. and I went through, he had a floppy di a floppy container full of disks that he shows on some of his videos. So we plugged the floppy drive into one of my Naboos and we were we, we went through almost all of them, eh, Leo? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we went through a ton, and we found a ton of net managers baseball. And who was it? Somebody used to have to enter in all of the plays from the previous game that day, like real games, yeah. so that that information was in there for people who were playing their fantasy baseball. Yeah, so what we did is these things called, uh, they were called uh, .sit files in CPM, but they were situation files in managers baseball. So what you would do is make a new play. Like every time we saw a new play, we would put a, a probability and that kind of stuff associated with it. Now there was a whole pile of stack plays, but there was other ones that we were adding to. We were actually customizing the game as was as it was already released. We were changing it, changing the rules and that kind of stuff to make it interesting. Because remember, if you're playing the same, if you pick the same plays and that kind of stuff, the likelihood that the encounter will be, besides some dice rolling, will be likely close to the same. Baseball is very statistical like that, right? But we wanted to throw some flair in it, so we kept on updating it. What would what, what would happen and that kind of stuff, and that even happened while we were in the era that we didn't have a ton of money. Uh, Bob McNally and I worked on a bunch of different things like that, and and where we we uploaded new new situations and that kind of stuff. So it was kind of neat. He did a lot of the QA on it, which was kind of neat because he was originally started as just a salesman, but he became the director of operations. But I used to say, here, no, 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 we'll take a look at this and. QA this for me for a while. I'm just about to put it up in the cycle. I got no QA department, so you can you might as well take a peek at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll have to. Well, maybe something magical will happen, and you'll you'll find the missing links. So yeah. There you go. Yep. <laughs> but I have other stuff that I haven't got to yet. I just have to get around to it. I've been busy and so on. And of course, other these uh, other places like uh, uh, we're going to other VCS, but virtually. Like um, uh, I'm planning to do a quick talk at VCF Southwest remotely, um, and also uh, Vancouver. I'm not sure if they managed to contact you, DJ, to to, to get you into the Vancouver. Oh panel. yeah, I, I did. I think I responded. I have responded to you. I haven't responded to them. It was in my spam folder for some reason. Yeah. Thanks for reminding me. Yeah, I should respond to that. And that's like what the end of June or middle yeah. of June. 23rd of June, but that will be Vancouver. So, but that's a panel. So it's not the, another like the same presentation. It's more yeah, like we can do it remote. That'll be good because I don't I don't leave the beach in the summertime. <laughs> <laughs> uh, totally understand. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or me personally, I, I'm this will be my first VCF uh, Midwest. I'm going to Midwest. Uh, it's be at its new location. So I'm looking forward to that. That's in September, starts September 6th. So that'll be we, we wanted to go to VCF Midwest. Did you still want to do that, DJ? Do you want me to contact those guys? You know, you should. You should. Because I know that like Robin always heads down there. I think it'd be fun to to go and meet I'm more people and tell the story. Yeah. Uh, I think it, I, I would like to tell the story from our perspective as much as we can, too, with a positive um framing around it because i think a lot of the times like i mentioned earlier there was a little bit of drama that occurred last year there was a lot of high emotions a lot of people were excited about things and i think kind of things went off the rails so a lot of people in the in the retro community looked at nabu going Ugh, you know it's immature it's new it's got too much drama and i i want to i want to show people that you know we have a lot of development a lot of technology being developed a lot of i've been doing a lot of work um gtam's been doing a lot of work the bomb's been doing a lot of work Bry John's been doing a lot of work. Like, there's been a lot of development. Production Dave, um, Intangibles, like, if I'm forgetting anybody, but and that's, I'm naming out people on our Discord who are doing a ton of development and pushing Nabu to some serious limits. Yeah, the current version of Make Magazine has a Brian Johnson article on Nabu. Like, 
hacking a Nabu, a, a vintage Nabu computer. Yeah, looking forward to that when that comes I'm trying out. Trying to find the the, the, the the copy. I mean, I know it's out, but it's difficult to find a print magazine these days. I don't know if it's out. Is yeah, it out? Because I know that Brian yeah, got it's it. Out, it's out. If you get if you if you try to subscribe to them digitally, you can get it. But the problem is that. Um, like as Canadians, we don't get the print version. I want to get a copy of the print version. You know? Yeah, it would be nice to have. So I got to find some smoke shop or that kind of stuff that still sells magazines. You know. <laughs> <Smoke> <laughs> uh, I'm sure you'll find one. Mm. I'm sure some people's got them. But yeah, um, and uh, it, it, speaking about also uh, all these new things that are just coming out for this uh nabu it's just it, it's, it's mind-blowing the stuff that people have come up with uh and uh with uh, uh nabu doom i believe how you say it. <laughs> nadoom nadoom <laughs> uh, nadoom and, and, nadoom. You're, and you're, i saw you have a vi uh, getting video on it off of the camera. <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> and, and then you can run it headless uh via some other things so that i mean it's just and then people are or coming up with different uh, some add-on cards for it. I know Rudy Retro Intel. He he did a very nice diagnostic on the Nabu. Yeah, I got a copy of it. Yeah, and that that was excellent. Uh, Rudy's uh, done very... the diagnostic card. He's also done a, a really good document on hardware documentation. Um, Bry John did the Mame emulator, and as well recently created something called the Lib MSX, which is a um, so one of the most powerful things about the NABU is that there is no BIOS, right? Like, yeah, that, uh, yeah. I was surprised by that. Yeah. Yeah. And well, the reason for it is because the NABU loads its, its BDOS or its BIOS over the cable and that BIOS is not static into ROM, which means that it can get updated as needed. So it's mm. not, it's not if there's a bug or if there's new features, it can just get updated. So various programs that Nabu created will use different versions of their iOS or XIOS. So iOS is the name is what not iPhone iOS. It's called iOS before iPhone. And that's their um, operating system that Nabu uses. It's the BIOS. And then if you load modules into it, those are called XIOS, so extended iOS. So if you needed to load a module for floppy drive access, it would be loaded in. So that was why there's no really BIOS in the NABU. And because of that, people might think it, it's, it's not great because there's no BIOS, but it's amazing because you can emulate any Z80 CPU with similar hardware, the Clico, the MSX, doesn't matter. Because what you can do is you can load in a version of the BIOS into any memory address that it needs to go. So if Clico's sits in a low memory address, you can throw it in there. If, if uh, you know, higher me memory address for MSX, you can throw it in there. So what the first thing that um, Brian John had done is he created this MSX emulator for the BIOS, and then you can take programs from MSX that use the BIOS, and they will just instantly run on the NABU. So he did a few, and I was having a hard time keeping up because I have to add them manually to the cloud server so that people can download them and run them on their NABU. And I, have to, I also made it so you can draw little, there's little icons for each program too, and little descriptions. So every time he would do it, I'd have to go out there and draw a little icon and update it. Well, GTAMP did a day, just threw, threw a wrench in the cog and uh, said, here you go. Um, I, I modified, what was it? 277 ROM files from MSX. So I was like, oh my God, I can't do all these. Turns out only around 70 of them work. So he gave me another file, which is a 70 of them, but still that's a lot of icons and descriptions. So I wrote a program that parses the binary file and extracts any ASCII characters. It's kind of like strings for Linux command or Unix command, kind of like that, but um, it tries to figure out more sentence structures. And it was funny because we found a lot of funny copyrights, not copyrights, like comments in there that don't get displayed in the real game. And GTAMP would show me some that were kind of funny, like comments that people had made that were authors of the game being like, well, Leo has a few in his in his games too that he's great, great, yeah. I guess you could say. <laughs> yeah, and then um, so the other then um, production Dave uh, he I, I created a library called Lib uh, Nabu Lib, which is essentially a more um, lightweight version and high performance version of what Z88 DK distributes, so that it's but it's tailored just for Nabu, so people can write games directly to, to that. Because again, there's no BIOS, right? So we have to do all those those things ourselves. And um, so Production David's made a, quite a few games like Space Invaders, 
and uh, Tetris with, with a good music soundtrack, a um, couple of the games like that. And Tangibles, he recently did a, um, I guess it's called the Steam Deck. It's like a little handheld Game Boy, like new, a new version of a Game Boy, right? Like it's a full-on controller that, that runs heavy-duty graphics and, and CPU. So he made a, a library package where you can just push a button and it automatically downloads everything and installs it onto your Steam Deck. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, yeah, of course, you mentioned I created Nadoom. And then um, I made it that actually last year. But when Fit hit the Shan, um, I decided that I was going to step away from it. So I never actually showed it till this year. And then uh, the other thing I created recently was uh, Nabu Cam, which is a camera on the Nabu. So I was super, super excited when I got it working the first time because it was actually like a real high frame rate with my compression ratio. And I was like, oh my God, it's working. And then um, <laughs> at UCF East, I announced I was going to do the color version of Nabu Cam. And well, hold my beer. And I did it. So that was my, <laughs> what was it, two weeks ago, I think I released that. And that's been getting a lot of, uh, a lot of attention people have been making youtube videos and stuff of cartoons and um cartoons look really good on the navu oh and then i did the mp3 streaming too so people listen to internet radio on the navu <laughs> that was kind of fun that's cool yeah that's yeah really neat. useless stuff but hey just for fun <laughs> yeah no like i said it's it just like i guess pretty much uh, you're only limited really by your imagination i mean because there's so much uh this uh well as you know a lot of these older machines uh they were never designed to do what they what the things that we have now mm -hmm. and uh, you can get them on wi-fi uh you know not for 1984. And, I'm, well i've been uh, really enjoying it because yeah. i think back then people looked at the nabu only like you were developing a computer it wasn't just nabu it was commerce for anything you developed with what you knew was possible right like your imagination was more limited than today and and now with what you expect from an iPhone or you expect from a wristwatch, um, we're trying to do in Z80s, right? And you're also trying to see that in Commodore 64. Like I recently, I used to love demos on PCs. I really think we recently got into watching demos on C64 because some of them are blowing my mind. And, you know, I don't think, I think if you showed that to somebody in 1984, their mind would be ultimately blown, right? Like it's just, nobody would have thought of something like that. Yeah. And yeah, I, I love it. I, I'm really enjoying getting involved in this community. It's um, it's not something I've always been interested in computers and always had a collection of them, but I never never knew there was a community around it. I mean, all my friends are we fish and we watch sports and play hockey and <laughs> drink beer. And I mean, it's my life's a totally different world. And so then I got involved into uh, this retro world. A lot of my friends are kind of like they don't get it. They call me Mr. Roboto and. <laughs> <laughs> and i tell you i, I enjoy it so much um i know i turned our discord into a uh hockey pool conversation so I, you know some people are upset at me for that <laughs> uh it's all good uh but yeah uh, i'm enjoying it too i've been sort of like the, uh, this is my first experience with the retro community and that kind of stuff so I'm just, in some cases i'm taken aback <laughs> yeah but but you know, but the weird part is, is that I just have I just pull stuff out of my basement and I go, hey, have anybody seen one of these before? And it's like, wow, <laughs> this is. Uh, I, I, in many cases, I have a lot of unique stuff, and I still have a lot of software to do out uh, to to bring out, and uh, and I actually have other software that's not even Nabu related of games that I worked on after Nabu that I'd like to recover as well. Um, um, and uh, DJ looks like he wants to get involved with that one. So we'll see what happens. Yes, yes, um, yes. I'm excited about that one. Is that our secret right now? We'll announce it later. Well, day. I know. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah. 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 I, I, I've, I've watched both of your videos. And uh, I and I remember, uh, Leo, I was watching you. I think it was your first or second video where you're bringing up all your, some of your Nabu stuff. And it had like... Uh, it hadn't seen the light of day for many years. Uh, you can you could count the cobwebs on it. You know. It's rusty now. <laughs> well, one one uh, 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 one guy that it was work. Uh, there was a there was a a student at uh, I work at Ericsson, and uh, there was there was a a uh, intern working there, and he saw that he was interested in the videos, and he saw that I was working right there. So I said, "Here, take the Nabu PC, go nuts!" But just so that you know, it looks like it's full of mouse shit. You know, so you gotta. <laughs> You might have to you might have to put on a like 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 an N95 mask before you deal with it kind of stuff, right? <laughs> but he cleaned it up for me very nicely, and in fact, it's the reference unit that I use when I'm demonstrating because it's such nice looking units now, right? <laughs> so, um, because you know, I I have nine Nabu PCs and like five keyboards, and 
and some of the keys are are not so good. So I I would like to get them all kind of working, but mostly I'd like to get them out there so that other people can that can play with them and that kind of stuff. For, mm -hmm. for I consider them research machines and so on. So uh, it would be nice to have them people play them. And I've had my granddaughters play with them and they like them and that kind of stuff. But they only like them so far because, of course, Roblox is more fun. But <laughs> <laughs> we're going to put Roblox in the Navu. That'll be the next thing. Be funny, yes. <laughs> well, well, I, uh, Leo, I liked how you were showing uh, how you had it set up uh, as far as like back in the day when you were programming. They're like, all right, so this one is the, uh, the, uh, I guess the uh, one that you, the machine that you use to do all the programming in it, mm -hmm. and then you take and you offload it and you put it on the other one for like the consumer one to, to mm -hmm. test it to see how it plays and stuff and i just thought that was very interesting i, yep. I always wondered how, always wondered how that worked so yeah it was nice that we ate our own dog food for throughout the entire thing whether we were using nabu 1100s at the beginning or nabu pcs when we were finally developing um we were all using the same stuff and so we got to gripe about it and we got to figure it out and fix them ourselves in many cases um so that was kind of neat and i'm pretty certain there's other like in ottawa anyway there's probably other people that have them sitting on some shelf in a basement right that that they they haven't pulled out when the cable system failed as i said there were at, there was at least eight thousand out that i knew of right and wow. might have been higher depending on like I did. so that means that there was a bunch more that are that are sitting out there maybe thrown out by now but mm -hmm. possibly still usable what the nice thing is is that they're nice and simple and they're easy to fix they're kind of they're easy to kind of to get going really right they use in, in, for the most part off-the-shelf parts and and, and in, in some cases like uh um like uh, grant uh, shannon goes by Clyball. he basically reverse engineered the floppy card so it's available now so that people can buy the floppy card if they want um they just have to source the chips themselves in many cases that old floppy controller is something very hard to get i've, I've, I've been told but they've been doing that and people are still working on other stuff they still want to get a hard drive going and that kind of stuff based on what I, this the stuff that i had going from years ago and that's interesting to see i'd like i'd like to see that pop out again there's stuff that i have there's one thing that i'm working on now i'm i'm trying those uh if you notice the the applications like the informer there was a thing called pcl that we used which is page control language which is something that was like it was one of the first markup languages i think it's it would be nice to sort of recover it just to show how we did markup language before HTML showed up, right? And it was the idea was to make applications that were teletext type applications that, that were info based applications, some graphics, but mostly text that people could page through and that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of those out there that, uh, those, and those things I'm trying to recover so that I can show the process from end to end um, uh, where, where we developed it, how, how we developed it too. So it would be neat to get those guys out there and those are the, those are in those floppies so they'll be with managers baseball more stuff to find more stuff to sort of <laughs> sit through and see if i can you know some of the stuff is corrupt right that's that's sure. become in 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 one case for instance uh we had one corrupt file for minor 2049 or source code um and i was working with labom to try to get it, scott scott labombard and um he um he, he basically ended up looking at the binary and recreated the source from the binary so it could become part of the source so that we could put something that was a compilable source. So that's kind of nice. So oh. we got that all working. And uh, so P if people take, for instance, the stuff that I put up on GitHub and they can recompile it for the Navo, it'll work. And if they want to change it, it'll work. If they want to make a Ms. Pac-Man game out of my Pac-Man game, it'll work. So that's kind of nice. It's nice to have like the beginning to end, the sort of Rosetta Stone moving from one system to another, so that if people want to bother recreating it, they can at least give it a shot, right? Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's really neat. Um, you know, and, and we're fortunate in this day and age. There are a lot of smart people out there uh, that that love this this stuff, and they just uh, are. It just amazes me, and and that's why I like doing uh, my my Sunday live streams because I have people that join me over from over the planet, and which is nice. Uh, and you know, of course, as you know, the time differences is a bit of a struggle on that. <laughs> but uh, just some of the stuff that they come up with just absolutely blows me away. And of course, um, you know, we have. 3D we printing bench. now, and we're able to make parts for things that, that you can't uh, unattainium anymore, which is great. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Well, what you're just mentioning about them creating, people creating new stuff. Last night, I was watching YouTube, and I came across a video that blew my mind. Have you seen, I can't remember the terminology, but 
essentially they're using buffer overflows inside of game cartridges on Nintendo to reprogram it to make the game into so you can turn um, Mario Brothers into Flappy Birds. So there's certain there's certain actions. Yeah, if if anyone watching you guys want to check it out, um, essentially if you play the game Mario Brothers will say and you override um, certain values like you kill too many things or you get too many points or you get too many uh, men you start doing buffer overflows and you can start actually overriding RAM and you can start putting code in and you can put code in by making the, the Mario brother move one pixel to the right and jumping and moving one pixel and you can do bootloaders. So this guy made it so that you can, he can actually do it by controller. He can program Flappy Birds into Mario Brothers. But what blew, and I've seen this a while ago now, this has been a couple of years, but what happened yesterday is he uses a speed run, um, essentially it's a macro program that will play back at very high precision keystrokes or joystick strokes into the into the Nintendo. And he actually wrote a bootloader. So the Mario Brothers character moves around and does a bunch of stuff, which loads a bootloader. Then once the bootloader is in, he can actually get to a point of the level where it opens up a bunch of RAM and he's able to load in the bad apple demo <laughs> into Mario Brothers. <laughs> and he also did the same thing with... Uh, he had a, a JPEG file, and in the JPEG file, he encoded actual machine code, and loading the JPEG file in would actually play Asteroids into Nintendo from Mario Brothers. We talk about people doing remarkable things. Like these have no application to a to a you know to anyone who's in capitalism or cares about finance. <laughs> You're not going to make money off this stuff. But for geeks like us, we can truly nerd out and rejoice that there's still people pushing limits of hardware that we find fascinating and doing stuff like we mentioned earlier, which is just, it's awesome. It's remarkable to see. Mm -hmm. It is, it, it is. And the, the thing with like what we do is we try to re-resurrect these old machines and we try to keep them out of the landfills um, because uh, I know like some of the older uh, like Max, um, it's nice to give them the people like kids that they play games. They go, these are the games that we had and they, and they like it uh, because it's like, wow, this is really cool. You know, and this is how we had to get the software on it. We had to put a floppy on there. That's how we <laughs> got the programs. And, and again, it, nowadays, you know, everything, we take everything for granted. You know, we download everything. Everything's on Wi-Fi, 5G, whatever. And you, you can download apps. You can send them to people. You can, uh airdrop uh, everything and that kind of stuff but back in the day uh you had to <laughs> you had to have the physical media to move it around mm -hmm. you know <laughs> so, and, and and you uh, still do and that's the scariest part i think that um <laughs> on a more serious note in this conversation is my biggest concern about the direction that humanity is taking is more people well, Leo explained at the beginning of this interview that he was involved in computer courses and he was teaching people kids and gates and basic and all these type of things. Kids are going through their entire school career and never learning how a CPU works or how basic language works or turtle graphics or what a floppy disk is. And what they're not realizing is all the technology they're used to, to TikTok and talk to their friends and everything, requires that type of understanding if you want to get a career in this place right so the people who are creating cpus today and the people who are creating technology today are the same people who are making technology 30 or 40 years ago when they retire we're going to be in a really strange place in humanity because there's not going to be a lot of understanding on how to a fix it and how to advance it because most kids aren't learning the skill sets necessary that's why i think people like yourself dave who mentioned kids you know putting kids in front of your apple computer and other people in the retro space like i know henry was talking about how his kid and a few others like mark were talking about how their kids are so interested in atari and things like that we need this vintage computing and retro computing community we need it because we are sharing that information to kids who hopefully will fall in love with it and they'll take it and they'll want to push it into their career and they want to do something with it. Otherwise, I don't know who's going to fix the next iPhone. <laughs> who's going to fix the next computer if no one knows how to do it anymore. 
Yeah, no, it's it, and that's that's why we do it. I mean, it, it's nice, uh, and you know, and it, and it's not just the vintage uh, vintage uh, computer stuff and or technology. I mean, it's 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 a lot of things. Um, I'll I'll, I'll uh, put this out there, like uh, okay, so like when I was a kid, uh, this is kind of getting off topic, but you know, we had model trains, okay, and of course we got older, we we uh, could afford. The things that maybe our parents threw away when we were younger, and and so uh, and they're they're pretty high tech, but again, uh, you see kind of a shift in the market because a lot of the people that enjoy this, they are they're not around anymore, and and so now you have all this younger group growing up. So what a lot of times what they're trying to do like uh, there's a big place out in New York that's a huge train place. Uh, I forget the name offhand, but they off they they do a lot of amazing stuff, uh, and they educate uh, kids and they try to get young kids involved in this, so that that way they can learn and enjoy it and stuff. And if they see the older stuff, they have a more appreciation for it. Um, like like my daughter, I'll use her for an example. We used to do a lot of yard sales and estate sales and stuff like that, so she's familiar with a lot of these things, um, like. She learned how to read an analog clock, okay? How many kids these days can read an old cuckoo clock, right? The Roman numerals and stuff like that? Not very many, probably. Uh, so, you know, she uh, was exposed. She know, knew what old computers were, new computers, um, just all the, the weird stuff that we used to get and come in contact with, Coca-Cola stuff, yeah, I mean, just all kinds of stuff, antiques. But uh, again, a lot of these younger kids, the, the things that they collect might be the, the the year that they were born. So say if they're born in the 90s, that's that's going to be the stuff they're going to gravitate to. Um, but but yeah, it's just it, it it's it's true for a lot of things. Not only for what we do here, but uh, it's just just kind of using that analogy on it. The the that's well said, and I think it resonated with me when you started talking about the model trains because I know Leo was in the model train. Him and Lisa were <laughs> in there at the BCF. <laughs> <laughs> They're loving it. And I, I guess in, in your analogy and what I'm trying to say is throughout generations, specific, it doesn't matter if it's about technology or just survival back in the days when before, you know, we had any industrial revolution. But throughout, throughout all of mankind's evolution technology, technologically, we've been building off the shoulders of giants. But we've never asked ourselves what happens when the last generation of giants die pass on and don't pass on that knowledge right and i think that's where we're at as a point is the, the the giants that we built our most recent technology on are starting to retire and pass and there's nobody who's taking the place of those giants so how do you create sure everyone's a c-sharp programmer but who created the c-sharp interpreter right everyone's a everyone's loving linux or unix or windows or any operating systems but who created the kernels who wrote who wrote the assembler who wrote the drivers right and that's the question that i think we all have to ask ourselves in the education system specifically in north america i think we have a very strong education system here we need to be able to do something about that soon because mm -hmm. we might be at the mercy to many other countries for uh, technological uh advancements yeah for sure all right. Well, I want to thank you guys for joining me today. It was a lot of fun. I, 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 I've been trying to pin you two down for a long time. <laughs> and I know you two are very busy. I appreciate uh, each of you. Um, and like I said, put your guys' uh, YouTube channels in there, if that's all right with you. That's uh, good that way for me. They can go to your channels and follow what you're doing. And uh, yeah.